Hello, and welcome to Rampant. For those who aren't aware, Rampant is a mod focused around the most underloved aspect of Factorio, the Biters. Specifically, it makes them smart, allowing them to probe defences and adapt to what we throw at them, as well as other features which will be revealed in time. To begin with, I mined some stone, as it is completely free and saves us creating pollution by mining it. I wonder what that little green patch is. This is where we mention the other thing that Rampant adds. Biter Factions These are acidic biters, which are essentially the same as the biters from the vanilla game. Also, they all start off tiny, but will grow beyond even vanilla behemoths as evolution increases. Talking about evolution, the second mod in this playthrough is Rampant Evolution. Because of how ruthless endgame biters are, the Rampant Evolution mod is almost a must when playing Rampant. It essentially turns evolution into a measure of how polluting you are being, not how polluting you have been. This means that evolution can come down if you start to adopt greener methods such as solar panels and efficiency modules. Polluting terrain, destroying trees with pollution and killing nests increase evolution, whilst killing biters and pollution being absorbed by trees decreases evolution. This means that I'll try to be green in the beginning to be relatively left alone by the biters, but once pollution ramps up, they will quickly evolve. I'm setting up high pollution buildings like boilers and dense forest to contain the pollution they produce. They will carry us through our early science. This is a prime time to talk about the next two mods, Clockwork and Nightfall. As you might notice, the night is very dark. This is because of the Clockwork mod, which makes the nights much longer and darker. This synergizes well with the next mod, Nightfall, which makes biters only attack at night. Although this sounds like it makes things easier, it actually just means you end up getting a day's worth of attacks at the same time as soon as night falls. Also, I will unfortunately actually have to use lamps this playthrough. YouTube hates darkness, so I'll try to keep nighttime footage limited until we have lamps and our night vision. It's time to start my starter base. I decided to embrace the spaghetti for this. It's nice to just build and not think about expandability and organisation. I'm automating ammo now. I think I'll need a lot of it. It's about time we paid the neighbours a visit. At such low evolution, the little biters provide little resistance. The worms, however, can still easily kill me. However, I'm taking it out now because some nests in Rampant can self-replicate, growing the base without resetting the global expansion timer, so I want to nip this one while it's still small. Here's the menu for the Rampant Evolution mod, showing how much effect each factor has on current evolution. As you can see, we're still at 0% because we haven't done much polluting. I'm adding copper to our starter base, so I can hopefully set up some basic automated science. I don't really know why, but I'm trying to preserve the ship crash this run. But we'll see how long that lasts when it ends up in the way of a train line. A power voltage reminds me that I haven't got coal on belts yet, and in fact I only have a single miner. Here I, despite having 800 hours in the game, struggle for almost a minute to set up a single green circuit assembler. I try to always set up automated gears and green circuits early, as every single one saves a half second of handcrafting. I will not notice that unpowered inserter for several minutes. Also, Clockwork adds these useful little gizmos to light up a large area. I don't think I've ever looked forward to unlocking night vision until now. I'm still at this point keeping a careful eye on pollution, not quite grasping how little a threat the tiny biters pose. It might have been a wise choice however, as once evolution kicks in properly the biters quickly become worse than anything vanilla can throw at you. To offset this, I installed our final mod, Rampant Arsenal. There's nothing to see of it yet however, as it's mostly focused on the later game when the stronger biters come. 
It includes many new weapons, including artillery shell types, more rockets, and even a higher tier of frame for fuel better than oil. In the background here, I finally start automating red sightings. I advanced quite slowly early on, and I still don't know if I was being too cautious or not cautious enough. Another power outage. This pushes me to automate the delivery of coal to the boilers. It was nice being a sentient logistic bot, but I've got a factory to build. I also decided to move the power into a better position, so I don't stray all that forest too quickly. Rampant evolution makes it very important to manage tree health, as healthy trees absorbing pollution actually decreases evolution slightly, but trees being destroyed by that pollution increases evolution massively. All this handcrafting is driving me insane, but my meagre iron supplies can't keep up with me automating frivolous items like pipes. I do scavenge the pump from the old power setup to save me some sanity though. An important part of this run will be a strong perimeter, so I want to automate walls ASAP. There won't be too a high demand, so I only make a tiny setup. When I start military science, I'll build some proper stone and stone brick production. I decide against two assemblers. My tiny furnace stack probably couldn't keep up with it anyway. But with that, they are at least being produced. Next, I build a green science setup without realising I never actually researched it. Then I expand iron in the most disgusting way to keep up with added demand. This might be a crime in several countries. But soon, the green science flows. And to prepare for my rapid expansion and isolation, I automate gun turrets. I don't know how effective they'll be as evolution progresses, but they evaporate the tiny biters. Despite supposedly being a defensive structure, my first use for them is on the offence. The base on my western borders become two, and soon they will be millions. Turret creep feels like bullying against such feeble foes. I should be going in there with my bare knuckles or something. They're so tiny, I can't even see them in the little Windows Movie Maker preview window. I just see the bullet impacts. Wanna see me run to that mountain and back? See me do it again? After that, I spy this small R patch containing about 160,000 iron. I would quite like to see that turned into 40,000 ammo magazines. There's probably some sort of Lord of War reference I can make here. And with a few snappy cuts, it is done. The evolution from iron ore to bullet is a very important process, and especially in this mod, deserves its own dedicated iron line. And with this new found source of ammo, I can begin to build my perimeter. Out of the four and a half hours I recorded for this part, two of them were me building this perimeter. 
It's probably a good time to mention, I did make a single concession on the difficulty of this mod. It allows you to turn off biters targeting train tracks, signals and large electric poles, which I did because I want to be able to build outposts and not have to subsume the land around them. As far as I know, they can still target trains, so a big enough group might destroy the occasional train to keep things interesting out in the boonies. We managed to get an IO patch within the walls, however, it only has three wells, so I don't think it'll be enough for long. Then, in the bottom right, I take a corner to make sure I get this copper patch in my walls. At this point, the only resource I don't have in or near my walls is stone, so I only have a hundred thousand to last me until I find more. I predict that this might cause us lots of problems later. With our perimeter secured, I can now focus on production, starting by tapping this small oil patch. I'm only storing it for now, as I'm not quite ready to utilise it. Those tiny furnace stacks I built in my starter base can't handle what I need, so I need to go large scale. Right now, I'm only planning one stack for iron and one for copper, as that's all I can reasonably support for trains. I will likely regret destroying so many trees further down the line, but if anything, this will only make them more interesting later. It's worth noting that Rampant Evolution only cares about trees destroyed by pollution, not anything else. Flamefoot has been an absolute disaster if normal tree destruction contributed. You've probably seen this green circuit build a billion times by now, but it's just too neat and elegant not to build. Our science production's been slow up until now, it's time to change that. Red and green science use so little resources that it is trivial to get one of each per second, even early on, so that's what I'll do. All it takes is 10 red science assemblers and 12 green science assemblers. With both of them cooking, I can get some serious research started. My first thought is night vision, but I soon realise that I'll need batteries to make any use of them, so getting oil products set up is the next goal. Fortunately, there's another patch down south in a relatively painless position for me to take. So I begin to build my border down to capture it. So much for that wrap around ammo belt. With the eastern side defended, I can bring my ammo belt in through the land bridge to where the oil is. With night approaching, I rush to set up a perimeter on the other side, as roaming biter parties become active at night. If they manage to destroy any buildings here, they might identify it as a weak point thanks to Rampant. Obviously the tiny biters won't cause much trouble, but once this place starts pumping out pollution it might stink out the nearby nests and start the evolution process for real. With the spot secured, I just need to get my walls to finish this perimeter and then start pumping home this black gold. Next up, I start expanding the array of refineries so that I can process all this new oil I'm collecting. I've always found oil processing, and just fluid management in general, the most tedious part of the game. This will only compound once we research advanced oil processing. This stone to the southwest is the only one now in radar range, so I might snag it later before evolution gets too great. The grey spots on this iron patch appear to be a different faction of biters, we'll know for sure when our pollution reaches them. I need coal for plastic production, so I gently clear a path through this forest to one of the coal patches we walled in. Whilst building, I noticed some corpses at the wall and opened my map to see this. They've expanded right up against our walls. This is Rampant's doing, no doubt about it, but I want to finish this plastic at the moment, so I'll leave them be. Plastic is one of those things you can have enough of one minute and then none of the next, so I make sure it's expandable. I think it's time to finish this part with a bang.
This is only a taster of what's to come in the next part. My pollution is now reaching nests, and we will soon see whether my little base can stand against the waves of increasingly large bugs. We return immediately after our explosive exit last time. This is our base as it is now. This part is going to be more focused on expanding our borders and ramping up production. To be frank, Rampant has been underwhelming up until now, so I hope that if I pump out ungodly amounts of pollution, the evolution should shoot up and make things a lot more interesting. Firstly, however, I'm setting up sulfur production, as it's required for a certain technology which will improve our efficiency massively. If you don't know why it is already, you will soon. Also, I fully understand how painful the pitch black nights are, and during the course of this episode, I gain access to some equipment which will negate it entirely. I also finally relent and start building real steel production. Some of you will already notice the glaring mistake I made. So do I eventually. I left no space for any wine or belt, and drawing from the old one would reduce throughput. This would be so much easier with bots. In the end, I set it up properly in steel floors. You may think this is quite a small steel setup. This is because it is. I have plans much bigger than this factory, it's just a stepping stone. Next up, I start engines, which makes us two thirds of the way to blue science. Considering my previous description of this base as a stepping stone, I completely overbuild engines. This is ridiculous, I'm not even fully armed in blue science. I must have realised at some point, as I don't even finish building the right side. Sincere apologies to any actually organised people. With engines on the belt, only red circuits remain for blue science. First however, I'm sick of handcrafting, so I throw a maul together. A maul is the most important part of the game, as across the entire playtime, it will likely save actual hours of handcrafting time. Getting important things like assemblers and inserters automated is essential for continued sanity. Between these four resources plus engines, we can make the majority of things we're going to need in the next stage of the game. The most important use for engines is flamethrower turrets. Gun turrets rip apart tiny and small biters, but once we get into a realm with larger biters, they won't be sufficient without flamethrowers. I also automate trains, as they are a big part of my plans for this playthrough. Our only stone patch is well below 100,000 now, so my next expansion will likely be towards this massive one in the southwest. However, I built enough walls by hand last episode to make me sick at the sight of them. So it's about time I messily automate the final ingredient of blue science, red circuits. Whilst this setup is tiny, it only really exists to get me to bots. But first, with some red circuits and a dirty battery set up, I get night vision at last. No more pitch black nights, at least until the batteries run out. Which they will, once I get the power hungry personal robo parts. You're gonna find yourself asking, in the next few clips, why I didn't fully automate blue science, since I had two of the three ingredients here, and the last one is on a belt. My answer to you is I have no idea, and only sat and realised this now. After realising the brain rottingly long amount of time this is going to take with only one assembler, I build a few more. Still hand feeding engines though, like a dumbass. Whilst I wait for the blue signs to accumulate, I start preparing our oil for advanced processing. I only convert two refineries to advanced at the moment however, as cracking is more hassle than it's worth when I only need minuscule amounts of heavy and light oil. I 
I deal with the light and heavy oil simply. All light oil gets turned into petroleum, and all heavy oil gets turned into lubricant. Light oil cracking can begin straight away, and I set up the lubricant production ready for when the research completes. In the interim, while blue science accumulates, I decide to go and destroy some nests. Small biters are beginning to appear increasingly as evolution progresses. For tiny nests such as these, I don't even need the turrets. But I can't resist a bit of nest evaporating. While I'm here, I also clear out the nests on that stone patch I was eyeing up earlier. With lubricant researched, it's time to get some bot prerequisites producing. For our current purposes, I only need 20 bots plus some spare in case some die, so I don't really need to automate the bots. This whole bot building process is a snooze however, so I'll skip to the fun part, actually using them. I want a cheap and simple blueprint I can copy paste to completely encapsulate that entire area around the new storm patch. Doing this for the first time is definitely the most satisfying part of any playthrough. As they are, our bots are incredibly slow and drain all of our armour's battery, but it's a lot better than doing it by hand. So to give my armour some time to recharge, I build the next section by hand. The wall eventually reaches the lake on the other side, and with this, our stone troubles are no more. I immediately set to work mining it, but not to feed my base yet, as my original stone patch still has a little more than 50,000 stone left. It's for a very different purpose, feeding this landfill factory. Since the stone patch is in the desert, and so close to biter nests, I decide to trial run the flame turrets in this southwestern corner. Of course, the bots do all the work. With this landfill, I am going to make... A bridge? I already have a land bridge to get here. There must be some sort of mysterious purpose to whatever this is. Eh, yeah, forget about it. Watch these flamethrowers in action. Ridiculously overkill at this stage, so I love it. Next, I set my eyes on the real prize. This massive area to the southeast. It has two huge iron patches, enough to last us possibly until we launch the rocket. As I still wasn't 100% familiar with how expansions work in Rampant, I decided to build the perimeter before I actually clear in the baiters. Also, a third iron patch was hiding down here, and between the three, they total more than 15 million R, so iron will be no issue for a long time. If I move too fast, not all the buildings will get built before they leave the rubber part range, so I just stand on the belt and let it carry me forward as it's constructed. However, an obstacle stands in our way. A very squishy obstacle. A wall of lead quickly neutralises the threat. If I don't fumble my ammo, that is. These low tier worms appear to be worse than the vanilla ones, however, I'm sure they'll compensate for that later. We return to wall construction. Between this clip and the last, I added Evo GUI mod, which shows the current bite revolution in the top left. Mm -hmm. 
We also evaporate another nest which has unfortunately found itself in our way. This has become almost pedestrian at this point, but I'm sure I'll miss it later when I need to crawl over hot coals to destroy a single nest. Finally, I reach the coast and finally close in this southeast corner. And once this final nest is destroyed, it's all ours. Now this is just typical. So now we have to fix this. With the southwest connected by train, we can begin transitioning our base into the next phase. A train base. All of my existing blueprint books are chunk aligned, but I'm not so bothered about that in this run, so I start a new book. First, I set up a station at the huge coal patch I captured earlier. The stack inserters are a bit unnecessary at this point, but at least it saves me replacing them later. And for some reason, instead of just splitting off an existing line, I decide to split the mines five ways, with one from just a few of the train. My own baffling decisions have almost become a secondary antagonist of the game at this point. Next I set up an iron mine. Normally I hate this kind of track spaghetti, and I kind of still do, but it'll have to do for now. A bit of director's commentary here, the entire train system in this series is a fucking disgrace. Another insane splitter, I didn't make these, they're from some blueprint book I found years ago. All of that iron has to go somewhere, so I set up some furnace stacks. In the end, there's going to be three furnace stacks here, one for iron, one for copper, one for steel. Each of these setups takes 384 inserters, which is a lot more than I had in hand, so it's going to take a lot of journeys back and forth to the mall to get this finished. Here is the waiting area for the furnace stacks. Those among you who have dealt with trains often will notice there's one less space than I will need, but sometimes, you just need to live on the edge. I'm not all daft though, there is space on either end to add more if there's a problem with it. To stop trains coming to stations which already have R, I hook up all the chests to the station and set a condition to only deliver if the total contents of the chest is less than 16,000. In the interim, while inserters craft, I build a station to pick up oil. This will be important soon. Here, I notice that biters have set up a siege on the northwestern wall and then promptly forget about it. I also connect this copper patch to our train network, leaving only stone as the final primary resource not hooked up. In the midst of this we begin to run out of power, so I intend to use this entire coal patch just for power, which will certainly last us until nuclear. Next, I set up three train stations for iron, copper and steel. Some of you might see where this is going. I'm using this to make red ammo. And repair kits. All of this has been for an outpost train, which is a train which is going to dot around and fulfil all of our defensive means at home and in outposts. With it, we will no longer have to worry about ruining ammo and oil, as well as repair packs once we have a bot network set up. Internally, we set fillers for the slots, since we don't need a full carriage of ammo or repair kits. We leave some space for things we might want to add later, such as artillery shells. It also has a fluid tank to carry flame for fuel. Currently crude oil, but later we could use napalm. 
Our first use of the outpost train will be to supply our southern wall with red ammo and fuel. This combinator setup makes it so the station is only active when one of the three resources is in short supply. With iron red ammo now readily available on the southern front, I start building frame throws. Look at them in action. With all of this added production, evolution has jumped up to 24% and shows no signs of stopping, so these defences will be getting tested soon. We finally reach the other end of the wall, and with that our entire southern border is protected with flamethrowers. Next time, we will finish the defences and start progressing through research, but with a pollution cloud this dense, it will spread quickly, and we will soon be getting pestered with thousands of biters. I'm going to hand it back to past Ryan now, as these next two parts were both recorded with audio originally. Keep in mind it was also the first time ever recording my voice, so it's probably going to be a bit choppy at points. Regardless, enjoy. This siege on the northwestern wall has continued to grow, and this little purple dot in the middle means that there's a new biter faction. They are known as spawner biters, and appear to even make new nests or more biters. Regardless, I'm planning to fix my mistake from the last episode by automating blue and black science. I'm not aiming for a massive amount of production because I have a lot of work to do on the trains and on defences, so it only needs to accumulate slowly in the background. My starting off patches are beginning to get a bit lean, so I'm going to clear out this area so I can bring in resources on trains instead. It may seem counterintuitive to destroy so many trees, but due to the rather than evolution mod, trees dying due to pollution it actually increases the evolution of the biters. But me throwing up grenades doesn't, and because they're so close to a the base, they're bound to die eventually, so this is actually a good idea. To put this into perspective, by the end of this episode, 70% evolution had been caused by dying trees, while only 10% had been caused by spawners absorbing, and 6% had been caused by destroying spawners. There is a trade-off however, as trees absorbing pollution actually decreases evolution up until when they get destroyed. By the end of this episode I had minus 36% evolution from trees absorbing pollution. You might notice here that my tracks take no damage from grenades. This is an option from the rampant mod which makes tracks, large power poles and rail signals indestructible, which makes outposting easier. You might think this is cheating, but it's completely necessary to maintain my sanity as it's already difficult enough without having to run out and replace power poles every 20 minutes. To supplement my dying stone supply, I built this janky setup to bring in stone from the mine we secured last episode. The diagonal unloading setup might be one of the most cursed things I've ever created. However, while I'm working on it, I get the sound. Arriving on the scene I can't immediately tell what happened. It was most likely just a lucky spit from a spitter took out a power pole and deprived the gun turrets of bullets. However, to be safe I take out the yellow ammo from them so they start picking up red ammo from the belt. Here we can see the extent to which the siege has grown on the northern wall. The spawner spit is now fully integrated into the swarm, taking up almost a quarter of it. I start to set up a station for the outpost train. However, I forget to actually leave space for inserters to pull out the chests. I am quite proud of the design however, it allows up to 6 different resources to be carried on the train, and it sends a request whenever any of them fall below a set threshold. With flamethrowers set up, I'm feeling a lot more comfortable about this siege. So comfortable, I'm probably going to leave it there for the drama. It's time to actually connect a stone mine for that train to collect from. I 
I set up an outpost train station in the southwest. Once this is connected, 100% of our defence will be running off the outpost trains from last episode. Next up is our first real taste of rampant arsenal. Right now, if you look at the research tab, I'm researching something called light artillery, which is sort of just like soft artillery cannons which can be used to keep biters away from the walls. No indication is given as to which ammo I should use, so I set up tank shells as it seemed like the most reasonable option. I set up this new train station, which the outpost train comes to after visiting the first one. This will fill it up on tank shells so it can take it to the outposts. I set up a half hand fed assembler to start crafting artillery turrets. I won't need many, so this will be enough to last me a long time. It's time for the moment of truth. As it turns out, Light Artillery doesn't use tank shells, but instead uses a new type of ammo called Launch Ammo, which is added by Rampant. Any type of grenade can be made into launcher ammo, so here we're making incendiary grenades to make incendiary launcher ammo. Since this is going to use a lot of light IO, I first set up Kraken so I can set all my refineries to advanced IO processing. We can finally see the light artillery in action. Its range isn't massive, but it's enough to keep the nests far away from the walls. Because their range is so small, it's most effective to have a couple of them along every wall. I made about 40 from that setup, so I have enough to cover the entire base. Yellow biter nests are starting to be mixed in now. These are called fast biters. No prizes for guessing what they do. Just in case you thought my rail system was anything but trash, here's the first of many deadlocks. I'm starting to set up light artillery on my entire primer. Here's me doing the southern wall. These white biter nests are called common biters, which are identical to biters from the vanilla game. Here's yet another deadlock. Before this playthrough, I basically only used one-on-one -on -one trains, so it's been a struggle getting used to designing for longer trains. This is one of the biggest reasons we need light artillery. A worm too close to wall will be but outranged like turrets, so it can sit there virtually unimpeded and destroy the walls. This is also our first introduction to fire biters, which are a late game faction which are entirely impervious to flame for us. I quickly set up light artillery on this wall to make sure this can't happen again. Yet another deadlock. I'm going to stop showing the small ones after this, and hopefully eventually once I do this enough there won't be any more whatsoever. It's worth noting now that I have three outpost trains. This is to make sure that none of the outposts ever run out of ammo. I'm setting up artillery on my southwest border now. Once this is finished, all of my walls will be protected by artillery. Here we can see a nest creation in action. When the purple cloud forms, the biters inside the group will begin turning the nests and worms. I don't let that happen. We only have around 2 million copper ore left on our walls, so we expand down south towards a copper patch to build an outpost. We also get some use out of this tank finally. With so many tiny targets, the game's aiming system actually starts to struggle to swap between them.
There's also a bite is on top of a copper patch. Because there's so many obstacles, I can't use my tank, so I use turret creep to take out the nests. Once it's all cleared, I leave a square of turret to stop expansions onto the patch while I build the perimeter. Next we will a pair of train stations. One of them is there to house an outpost train, or the other one's there for another train to come pick up copper. I immediately start building a turret wall on the patch so we can begin mining from it. This is the same as every other wall I've built so I'll skip until when it's finished. Whenever an expansion starts too close to my walls, it leaves these massive damage patches from the purple goo. To this end, it is clear that I'll soon need to set up robo parts for automatic wall repair. With the patch fully defended and artillery set up, we're ready to start mining it. This is the one downside to fire artillery. Because of one biter among the trees, the entire forest to the north of the resource patch is toast. I didn't have enough belts on me to fully connect on the mines, however this is enough to stave off a copper shortage for a long time. Talking about shortages, I connect this iron patch to my train network, as steel production is taking up most of the output from the old one. This is what I've needed all this extra iron and copper for. I want to build a dedicated green circuit factory on the train network. The reason for this is because once producing all science, green circuits take up over a half of all the copper and almost a quarter of all the iron used. This means that if I produce them here instead of on the bus, then my bus can be much smaller which saves a lot of space and complexity. It's worth mentioning at this point that I'm using a mod to allow me to pick whether inserters insert on the close or far side of the belt. This is to make some setups much easier and more compact. It's also because it's the only thing that fit above my smelting lanes, I didn't want to rebuild them. Now that we're producing green circuits, I can expand my bus and start producing some advanced products we should have been making sooner. First, I set up this train stop to take in the green circuits. Now that it's connected with the bus I can disconnect the old setup because we don't need it anymore. Next I build this red circuit setup. I use this dead simple design which lets me expand up to 36 red circuit assemblers if I need it. The most important thing I can do is red circuit is build modules. I will be making efficiency modules to reduce power usage and productivity modules for my labs. The most important thing from right now is reducing pollution, as in the last couple of hours evolution has jumped from 25 to 62%. If I don't reduce my pollution soon, I'll quickly find myself outpaced by the biters. My two biggest polluters currently are boilers and electric miners. The pollution for mines can be offset easily using efficiency modules. However, for the boilers, we're going to have to go for a different approach. The most obvious answer is, of course, nuclear power. It can be made almost entirely pollution free if we use efficiency modules, and it can output massive amounts of power. For example, a 2x2 reactor setup would output 5 times the amount of power that our current setup provides. We aren't quite ready for nuclear power yet, however we do set up some centrifuges to accumulate uranium-235 when we are ready. Next we prepare to mass produce robots. I have a feeling we need a lot of them, I might even put them on trains eventually. I build this little setup but massively underestimate how many robot frame assemblers I could support, so I tear it down and build a better one. Connecting the entire base in a massive robot network would be a terrible idea in this mod, so instead I plan that every outpost train drop up of its own robot network. This is why I put repair packs on the outpost train. 
nuclear power buildings are way too expensive to handcraft or whatever, so I build this setup to do it for me. Spot the missing part, because I didn't. This bus chicane is incredibly ugly, however I didn't plan this far ahead when I built the bus 15 hours ago. I also begin out emitting rubber parts so I can cover my walls in them. I first set them up my copper outpost, because that would be the biggest pain to repair if something were to happen to it. Once the heat exchange is finished crafting, I start to spitball a design for the final power plant. This is what I come up with on the boiling side, however it will be much more complicated when I start building turbines where throughput is a lot more important. In the background, while turbines craft, I completely cover armor walls and robot parts. To build the most fuel efficient reactor I possibly can, I need 40 steam tanks, which will hold a full burn of all four reactors. The design isn't perfect and probably won't reach its theoretical maximum of 480 megawatts, however I don't need it to. I don't plan to be on this planet much longer and as long as it can reach about 4 megawatts, it'll serve its purpose fine. Overall we need 83 turbines to keep up with the 4 reactors, so this janky setup will finish it up. In total I've probably spent about 40 minutes messing around with complicated circuit conditions and clocks trying to get this reactor as fuel efficient as possible. I even set up this quirky time lapse once I thought it was working, but in the end it didn't. In the end, it often turns out that the simplest solutions are the best ones, so I pulled apart this janky circuit system. Now, the inserters are set to insert a fuel rod as soon as a spent one's ejected. This means to control when fuel rods are inserted, we simply need to control when they're ejected. To do this, I control the output inserters so they can only pull out a fuel rod if steam is below a certain level. With this, our reactor finally works and we can finish this episode. Thank you for watching, and tell me in the comments if you like the new voiceover instead of the text. With our walls secured, biters biting, and power production fully set up, it's time to move on to the next part of the game, winning it. We have two more science packs we need to automate before we can make the rocket silo, the yellow utility science and the purple production science. To research the rocket silo and finish the game, we need 1600 purple science and 1300 yellow science. For this reason, I'm building yellow and purple science at only 15 science per minute, as any higher would be unnecessary. Because our old lab setup could already handle 4 sciences, I rebuild it so it can handle up to 6. Because our yellow and purple science production is going to be so low, I build a buffer so even while we aren't researching it continues to produce. I'm starting to run out of copper on my main bus, but instead of trying to fit another lane through the spaghetti, I had a train stop further down and add the copper on halfway down the bus. With that sorted, I start setting up purple science. Again, I'm only aiming 15 signs per minute here. It's time for now for me to start preparing materials for the rocket silo. If I use 4 productivity module 3s in the silo, I'll only need about 750 rocket fuel to launch a rocket. That's about 1.5 steel chests of rocket fuel. Along with collecting spare LGS and blue chips from yellow science production, I should have enough parts for the rocket before the silo has even finished researching. You might have noticed me building some higher level modules in the background, this is what it's been for. 
With this power armor, I should be more easily able to go out and clear bait nests. Before that, however, I build this supplemental blue chip production, as it's used in a lot of the personal equipment we need. These particle fusion reactors are a game changer. They produce the same amount of power as 25 solar panels, but only take up 16 solar panels worth of space, and can even produce at night. It's time to take this for a spin. Due to Power Armor's 70% resistance to acid, the only thing that can really touch is biters, and they quickly get picked off by the reaches by the laser defences. This is as good a time as any to talk about my opinion of this mod. To begin with, I think the concept of multiple different biter factions is absolutely incredible. It really varies defensive and offensive play and forces you to use more than just flamethrower turrets on the walls. I also think the AI is incredible, and I really wish that the biters in the base game expanded in the same way they do in this mod. It leads to really interesting situations such as this, where this siege has literally been building up for 20 hours at this point. There are downsides however, I really feel at this point in the game I shouldn't be able to tear through nests quite this easily, even with my power armour. Also, for a mod initially all about the AI, I haven't really noticed the difference in the way the biters attack, only the way they expand. Overall though, this has been a really different and interesting experience, and I would definitely play it again. But if I did, I'd probably use the Death World preset instead of default, because I feel like I had a way too much time to set up before I actually got bothered by the biters. Enough of me talking though, I'll let you get back to the carnage. And just like that, that massive siege which has been there since the start of the game is gone. I might almost miss it. While out in the field down south, the rocket silo research finally completes. I place it down in the yard while yellow science production and put in the four prod 3 modules I made earlier. I set up these assemblers to hand feed rocket control units. I probably should have automated them, but I was starting to get a bit bored and just wanted to finish the game at this point. While I was waiting for things to craft, I went back out in the field to kill my biters, and I found a new type of biter had spawned. These are poison biters, and leave these green clouds when they die, which I have very little resistance to. This is the moment we've all been waiting for. I put my car in the rocket cargo and hopped in. I can now proudly say I've beaten the Rampant mod, however this isn't the end of the video yet. I want to play around with Spidertrons at some point, however it takes 2,500 signs to research them. At my current rate of production that would take almost 2 hours, so I'm only allowing labs with productivity module 3s in them to take science at the moment. Even that only shaves about 10 minutes off, unfortunately. After a lot of waiting and fixing train to drugs, it finally finishes and we can have a bit of fun. Feeling wise, getting the first spider tron of a player for is right up there with getting bots for the first time. Before we can really use the spider tron in combat, I built this explosive rocket factory to provide it ammo. We set up its equipment similar to my own and provided rockets using the robot logistics network. Here's the first test run. The Spidertron's armour is actually weaker than my own, so I run in first and task it to follow me. Even despite that, it still takes a lot of damage. The only answer to this is of course, more firepower. And even more firepower. With these three in tow, I basically have a firepower of 12 people. The biters never really stood a chance. The 
despite my efforts, these nests have only come back in time. The shadowy outlines of nests you can see dotted around are what I believe to be nests expanding naturally within the bases. That is part of how these rampant bases can grow to be so large. As this playthrough comes to a close, there's one last thing I wanted to do. Using a command, I set evolution to 99% so we can see how long this base will last. Now all nests produce 100% tier 10 biters. This is this mod's version of the behemoth, called Leviathans. As you can see, they are slowly chipping away at our walls and it's the long that'll break through. I take the spider trons out for a spin, but as you can see, the biters are a lot more resistant to them now. To further increase the threat, I use a command to release a billion pollution over my head. This is more than even a mega base would produce in a day. You can see its effect already, a massive expanding perfect circle of pollution around my base. This is its effect as it expands out over the lake to the west of my base. Massive attacks start rolling in. This little choke point is probably the weakest part of my entire defence. Even despite that, it's probably going to take them a couple of attempts to get in. It doesn't take long, however, before another one comes. This is the beginning of the end. I position a Spidertron so even if the power goes out I keep eyes on this choke point. I also put one in the lake near my nuclear power plant because I really want to see it blow when they reach it. Because of that command I used to add pollution, thousands of biters are spawning all over the map. That's far too much computation for my dinky little computer, so only some of them are actually moving at any given time, and the rest of them stand for us and like this. At that choke point in the northeast, however, the big one finally breaks through. I set the inserters to deliver as much fuel as possible into the nuclear power plant. This ensures that when they get destroyed, they'll melt down instead of just disappearing. This is where all my UPS went. After all this, I suppose all that's left is to enter into the swarm. Thank you for watching. Special thanks to our patrons, Dick Dastery Enthusiast, Handlebars, Matthias Faison and Fenbrew.